What's up, everybody? Rob here. So, last week, Netflix just announced it's moving forward with its plans to produce the Wheel of Time series on its network. And for those who don't know, the Wheel of Time series is an epic, in every sense of the word, high fantasy series that was written by Robert Jordan. And it's one of the few works that I've actually bothered to reread. It's uh, one of my favorite works you know, ever. I love it. And I'm actually cautious, uh, cautiously optimistic about them actually being able to pull this off. Um, again, I'm not really going to do a review or how I think they could, you know, do this. I'll do a video on that when uh, more information comes out. But this is also coming on heels of Revelation. I think it is Netflix as well. They're also going to be doing a Witcher series. I don't really have much of it. I mean, I've read some of the books on the Witcher series. I've never played the games, but um, uh, I've read some of the books and, you know, it's okay, fine. And um, Amazon is also producing a Lord of the Rings series, which I'm dead set against. We already have three of possibly the finest movies ever made. Um, yeah, it's just, I mean, Lord of the Rings is off limits. I just have no faith in that one, you know, doing well. But in recent years, the fantasy genre has really taken off in popularity. I mean, uh, I remember growing up, I grew up in the 90s, when that was reserved for the geeks and the nerds and, you know, the uncool kids. Um, even I didn't, you know, get into the genre until I was in, actually past college. I graduated um, from college when I first got to the genre, and uh, no, I wasn't a cool kid in high school by any stretch of the imagination. But right now, the most popular show on television involves dragons and guys with swords hacking away at other guys with swords. And yes, I'm talking about Game of Thrones in case you haven't figured it out. Uh, but the point is that, you know, uh, there's been, an, uh, mostly due to, I think it ultimately started with the Lord of the Rings, you know, the movie series back in the early 2000s, and now with Game of Thrones and, you know, other works like that. You know, the fantasy genre is really taking off in popularity. So uh, this is just some things, um, some of the books that I have read and what I think would make excellent TV shows or movies. And here they are in no particular order. So first up is the Powder Mage series by Brian McClellan. And it is actually kind of refreshing in as far as the fantasy genre goes. Now, most fantasy genres take place in a medieval-esque type world where it's basically Europe somewhere between 1100 and 1500 thereabouts. Uh, this takes place in a world that is very similar to, you know, not quite Industrial Revolution, but just sort of that. I, I get a very... Well, um, okay, spoilers ahead here. Um... The, well, it's not really a spoiler because this is revealed in chapter one of the first book, so I don't know how much of a spoiler it really is. But um, yeah, it basically starts off with something that is very, very rem reminiscent of the French Revolution. So it is not quite industrialized yet, but it is definitely not, you know, the typical medieval fantasy either. Somewhere, you know, in between there. And the use of technology, mostly in the form of gunpowder, is a pivotal part of the magic system. Now, in addition to the unique setting, it also has a very unique set of characters who basically feel like real people. They have their ho um, own hopes and dreams and aspirations and goals outside of that of just the plot. They're not just, you know, shoved in for plot conveniences, but they actually feel like real people. In addition to that, there's also epic battles, um, political intrigue, and, you know, uh, just basically everything you could want in a fantasy story. Again, in this very unique setting, which, you know, hasn't been seen before. It's not just guys with swords hacking at other guys with swords. So it will be something, you know, completely unique and not just, you know, another Game of Thrones ripoff. Um, plus, I, I've done another video on this. I really think that firearms are underutilized in a fantasy setting, so maybe I am biased a little bit, but... Um, yeah, actually seeing, you know, guns being used regularly and actually being an integral part of the magic system, um, I thought it was really awesome, just as a concept alone. And then combine that with, you know, very well told story. Um, I really think this would be a really cool and uh, refreshing thing to see on the large or small screen. So yeah, Powder Mage series by Brian McClellan. All right, next up you have the Black Company series by Glenn Cook. Now, this is actually, uh, on face value, it is pretty much a standard fantasy story, except that it has a few minor twists to it. Now, it follows the exploits of the Black Company, which is a mercenary band, but instead of fighting for, you know, most fantasy stories, you know, truth, goodness, and light, and all that stuff, they work for the evil overlord. Okay, so it's told from pretty much the bad guy's perspective, and um, as much as it may sound like it's going to be a very um, bloody, action-filled thing, but generally speaking, the fighting and the battles are pretty secondary. There's actually, the books themselves are not particularly exciting. I mean, they do have their moments, but it's not really about that. It's basically about the Black Company, this mercenary band, and it's 
them basically getting involved in their pawns in a massive power struggle. You have the evil overlord, the minions of the evil overlord who may or may not be loyal and how there's politicking amongst them. And these are all vastly powerful wizards, just so you know, like the, the various um, people involved. And they're fighting against the rebels who are, you know, the forces of good. And I've used that term very loosely because they could be just as evil as the evil people. And it's basically um, political maneuverings and... Um, you know, betrayals and that sort of thing. Uh, it's much more subtle in that regard. It's not just like a gigantic CG clash of arms and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that does happen, but mostly it's about the subtle betrayals and backstabbings and uh, political maneuverings and that sort of thing, which I think would be pretty cool to watch, you know? I, and again, there are some battles in there which would be pretty cool, and they're going to have to flush them out a bit more uh, than they are in the books, but I honestly think it would be pretty cool to see. Now, I do have to say, though, that the visuals in this are going to require the effects department has got their work cut out for them because there are some weird things that you see in this series. I think it was, um, was it Eric Erickson? I, I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but there was a, a reviewer, somebody or an author, somebody who read this and said, basically, it's like a Vietnam War flashback on peyote or something to that effect. Basically, like, there's some really weird stuff. Like, it's a drug trip, some of the visuals that you're going to be seeing in here. Like, just weird creatures. I think it was in the second book called The White Rose, uh, where the company's out in the wasteland, and they're, uh, you know, interacting with a lot of weird creatures. I mean, we are talking, like, dude, you are high as hell to come up with this stuff. And honestly, I think it would be really awesome to see. So, um, personally, yeah, the Black Company series, I think it would be pretty interesting. Um, again, not necessarily your typical fantasy story, just, uh, yeah, something a little weird, something a little different, and a lot of fun. And also, like always, if you haven't read it, by all means, check it out. It is fantastic. Again, don't expect, like, a big, you know, exciting, you know, action-adventure story. It's not that at all, but I highly recommend it nonetheless. Also, I think it might be worth it just to see the ongoing clash between Goblin and One-Eye, the company's two wizards. Well, there's a third one, but, you know, we don't talk about him. and He doesn't talk that much either. But, um, yeah, if you've read the series, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. All right, so next up we have the Heralds of Valdemar series by Mercedes Lackey. Now, the Heralds of Valdemar, I think, is going to be a bit of a challenge, and let me tell you why. The Heralds of Valdemar is not a series, but a series of series. You see, um, it's more of a setting than a single story. So you can say, like, okay, Lord of the Rings, what is the story? You can give the plot. You can say, um, you know, the Black Company, what's the story? What happened? Give it a plot. What is the story of the Heralds of Valdemar? Well, there really isn't one. There's a bunch of series. Now, they're sometimes standalone novels, sometimes they're duologies or trilogies, and they take place in various times throughout Valdemar. Valdemar is a kingdom, and it um, tells the story of the Heralds, which are... I'm not going to say magical because they're not necessarily magical. There are a couple herald mages who do use magic, but a lot of them are just, you know, regular people. However, they are bonded to, um, well, you see that horse in the picture there? That's not a horse. That's actually known as a companion, and they're magical type creatures that look like horses, but they're not. Um, anyway, the heralds are all-purpose agents of the crown. They basically do whatever their abilities and um, the situation calls for. So you can have soldiers, you can have... Um, Diplomats, assassins, um, general bodyguards, you know, all, all kinds of stuff like that. Any case, um, because of this, there's a wide variety of things that you can do with this series. Um, again, I don't think this would be good as a long-running series over the course of many seasons, but rather, say, mini-series or a standalone, you know, like made-for-TV movie type of thing. Uh, for example, um, people are always saying, oh, we need strong female characters. There aren't any strong female characters. Okay, Carolyn. She's a fantastic, strong female character, and um, her story was in By the Sword, which is a great novel. And um, yeah, put that on there. Just a one-off event. Like it doesn't have to be a whole, you know, multi-year series. Just you know, have the miniseries or just you know a single standalone movie. And we can basically do the same thing with any of the other series within the series. So you have the Exile series, which is my personal favorite. It follows Albrecht, who, who is not actually from Valdemar. He's from a rival kingdom. And he basically becomes a herald of Valdemar for reasons. If you read the stories, it makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's basically him being there. And he's highly, it's a very highly militaristic one. Um, the first book um, actually ends with a B 
big major battle scene. But you can also have the tale of Harold Vaniel and a um, whole bunch of others. Uh, Brightly Burning about a Harold Mage who basically, you know, single-handedly vaporized an, an entire Karsite army. And a whole bunch of others. I think the major problem here, though, is trying to connect them all together. So if you say do, you know, Carowind's story, okay, how does that connect to Albrecht's story or Harold Vaniel's story? The answer is not by much. I mean, by setting, yes, but otherwise they're completely unrelated, and actually most of these characters actually never even met each other, weren't even alive in some cases at the same time. So it might be a bit jarring for people, you know, to, you know, to, to see that, you know, like, well, what does this have to do with, you know, that? what does Harold Vaniel have to do with um, um, Albrecht? Well, nothing. They, they have no connections whatsoever. Um, but then again, if it works in a novel format, which, you know, the Herald of Valdemar is a very successful series. I don't see why it can't work on TV. Now, just because this hasn't been done on television, um, or I can't recall it ever being done on television, doesn't mean it can't be done. So, hey, let's try it. You know, it might be interesting. And, um, yeah, just for the overall aesthetic, I didn't really go into this that much. This is straight-up high fantasy, okay? You got magic, you got wizards, and people shooting fireballs out of their hands. There's a quasi-medieval setting in there, guys with swords. It's just, you know, it's high fantasy. It's awesome. And so, yeah, Heralds of Valdemar series by Mercedes Lackey. And once again, if you haven't read the books, by all means, check them out. And uh, as far as what order to read them in, some people say chronological order within the series itself, like within the context of the books. Some say publication order. I say it really doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, there you go. All right, so next up you have the First Law series by Joe Amber Crombie. Now, if you've ever read these series, these things are massively popular. And um, if you haven't read them, you are missing out. These are some of the best fantasy novels I've ever read. And um, yeah, I'm actually surprised that it hasn't made it to the big screen already, or any screen particularly already. Um, you have a low fantasy, but still magically, you know, there's some magic involved uh, type setting there. But it is gritty. It is brutal. It's basically Game of Thrones, but a little less on the politics, more on the brutality and the stabbings and the bloodiness and the just, you know, very fleshy type of tone to it. Um, now, the first three novels in the series, The Blade Itself, Before They Are Hanged, and The Last Argument of Kings is a single narrative. It is, you know, one story, typical trilogy. The other three books are standalone novels that take place in the same universe and within the same timeline. There's a lot of crossover characters and um, you know, stuff like that. So I would actually recommend... Um, if this was going to be put on a uh, TV or a movie series or something like that, I would say just do the um, original trilogy and maybe you can have the others as spin It's basically just the same way the books came out. And um, yeah, these are fantastic. The characters there are incredibly unique. They are hilarious and tragic at the same time. You get a real sense of the frustrations and... Um, you know, the plight of many of these characters and why they are acting the way they're acting due to their past histories, which are constantly coming back to haunt them. Also, just be forewarned that this is not a happy series. Things don't, you know, get better. They just suck somewhat less until, well, they continue to suck just as much, but in a different way. But yeah, uh, basically there's no happy endings. People's spirits and souls just get ground down throughout the course of the series. It is just not for, you know, people who like, if you're looking for a pick-me-up type of story, you are in the wrong place here. But, um, yeah, I'm actually am shocked. I am completely shocked that these haven't been made into a movie yet or a TV series yet. I am absolutely shocked. So, yeah, uh, the First Law series by Joe Abercrombie. Check them out. They're awesome. But be forewarned, you're not going to find a happy ending here. All right, so next up we have Legend by David Gemmell. Now, David Gemmell is one of my favorite authors, and he was an absolutely prolific writer. He wrote, I think, over 30 novels during his career, and um, I've never read one that I did not like. Um, you have the Stones of Power series. You have some alternate histories involving, well, the Stones of Power, but they're not somehow connected to the Stones of Power series. Like, the publishers made them a different series, but they're related. It's weird. But some alternate histories involving Alexander the Great, another one involving Uther Pendragon, and just really good stuff. As well as a non-fantasy thing, it's an alternate history of the Trojan War. It's the Trojan uh, Trilogy by David Gemmell fantastic. But if you're going to put something on the silver screen or on the small screens in front of your faces right now, there's nothing you can do better than his first novel, which was Legend. 
Now, it eventually did tie into other series as well, the Drain My series, as well as um, Trust the Legend series that he did write. Um, that being said, though, Legend is a standalone novel, and it was intended as a standalone novel, and the others were basically spinoffs and prequels of this particular one. Now, in a lot of fantasy series, like uh, Game of Thrones or The Wheel of Time, there's plots within plots, wheels within wheels. Uh, the pun there was semi-unintended. Uh, but basically, there's a lot going on at once, and they all have to, you know, merge together, and they diverge, and then they come back together again, and they overlap each other, and, you know, there's all that stuff going on. David Gemmel does not really do that. The story of Legend is very straightforward. There's a fortress. The defenders inside are outnumbered by a massive margin. There is very little hope for survival or victory, and they fight to the death. It's basically dudes with swords on one side fighting dudes with swords on the other side. There's no plot twist, there's no Chekhov's guns going off, there's nothing like that. What you see is what you get, and it's awesome. This thing is 100% pure spectacle. It is well written, don't get me wrong, but this is just like, you know, massive armies, huge battle scenes, guys, like, look at that. Like, look at, see that, the picture there? Yeah, that's, that's the novel encapsulated right there. You got guys with swords, a giant axe, he's hacking people apart, it's epic, it's, it's awesome, it's pure spectacle, it's it's going to need something like, you know, Man of War or Amon Amarth in the background for the score. It's not like an orchestra just won't cut it. You're going to need, like, metal. There's going to be, like, you know, just pure testosterone in this. So, yeah, it's not complex at all. It doesn't have people, like, you know, gazing longingly out of a window or anything like that. Or, you know, um, political machinations of, you know, politicians far off. No, it's just guys with swords butchering other guys with swords. And you know what? You're going to love it. I'm going to love it. It's going to be great. Make this happen. All right, so last and certainly not least is the Mistborn series by Brandon Sanderson. Now, if you've read the Mistborn series, you probably wanted this to be a movie or TV show as well. Um, when I first read this, I thought, wow, somebody really needs to make a TV show out of this. So right now, the undisputed king of the fantasy genre is Brandon Sanderson. Uh, there may be authors like J.K. Rowling or George R.R. Uh, George R. Martin that have sold more, but none of them are churning out books, quality books, at the same rate as Sanderson. Now, the Mistborn series is part of a larger collection called The Cosmere, which involves various works, including the Stormlight Archives, Elantris, and Warbreaker. And of those, I really think Mistborn would be the best one suited for television. Uh, Elantris was good. I did like Elantris a lot. Um, just something about it, it just doesn't appear, seem to have... Um, you know, a television type appeal to it. Uh, Warbreaker, I really like. That's one of his more underrated works. I really did like Warbreaker a lot, but um, I don't know. Again, it doesn't have the same popularity as Mistborn and the Stormlight Archive. I have no idea how you're going to pull that one off. I have no idea how that could possibly be turned into a television series at all. It's too big. It's too complex. There's just too much involved with that. But then again, I also said the same thing about the Wheel of Time and... Um, you know, uh, a Song of Ice and Fire series. So, you know, I have been wrong before, but I think Stormlight is a little bit too much. But Mistborn is perfect. It's actually my favorite of the entire Cosmere series, and I think many of you feel the same way. Now, Sanderson's big claim to fame is his very well thought out and well written magic systems. Uh, basically, according to his logic, magic is part of the natural world. It's a force that exists in the world, so why would people not study? It basically would just become a science. And if it's a science, it could be measured and uh, quantified. And many people say that, well, that takes the mystery out of the magic system. And yes, it does. But in the same way, it also can be used to increase tension. So um, if you really understand how a magic system actually works, you know it has limitations. So if a character is in a particular scenario, they're not just going to like ASX Mac it their way out of there. Because if you don't really understand how the magic system works, oh yeah, well, they can totally shoot fireballs out of their hands. Yeah, we can totally do that. And then like a later scene will say, yeah, that's something we can totally do under these circumstances. So the magic system in Mistborn relies upon the ingestion of metals, like actual metals like steel and iron, uh, bronze, copper, etc., etc. And you ingest these metals, just little flakes of it, and you burn that. Basically, you metabolize it within your body, and then that produces a magical effect. And if you run out of metal, you run out of the magic, and you need to go out and ingest more of it. So there's a very finite fuel supply, and each metal has a very specific effect that does very specific things. So for example, um, steel and iron, they're both complementary to one another. Steel pushes metal objects away from you, and iron pulls it towards you. But, however, it's not 
full-on telekinesis. It can go, the objects are either pulled or pushed directly towards your center of gravity. That is it. You can't move from side to side, it either comes directly towards you, or if it weighs more or if it's anchored to the ground, you get pulled towards it. So uh, something a character can do to fly, sort of, it's, it's actually described as like falling in reverse, but whatever. Um, you take a coin, you put it on the ground, and it's anchored to the ground, like it's supported by the ground, and then you push against it. So now your center of gravity is now pushing against the earth off of this coin that's on the ground, and you shoot upward. So each metal has a very specific effect, and will only do that very specific thing. And if a magic user happens to run out of the metal while they're in the middle of doing whatever it is, well, they are out of luck. For example, they talk about... Um, there's a particular person who um, was using pewter, which is used to grant strength, and they ran out of pewter as they were lifting this heavy safe, and they dropped it square on their foot. Now, with this very unique magic system, there is a very unique plot. So, this is a world in which the evil overlord has won. And the story centers around a group of individuals who are planning a rebellion against said evil overlord, except not quite. See, they have been... Um, armed rebellions in the past, um, and they have all failed. So instead of battling the evil overlord, they're going to rob him. Okay, it's basically a heist novel. This is basically Ocean's Eleven meets Lord of the Rings. So Mistborn is a completely different spin on the typical fantasy story. The characters in it are very well fleshed out and very well written. They have their own hopes, dreams, motivations, and aspirations. They're not just there to serve a plot purpose, they're there because they feel like actual, real people who are caught up in these events, or are actively participating in these events. Like, they're really driving the plot forward, and they're not just being carried along by the events of the story. And the visuals of this would be absolutely fun to watch. I mean, you have, you know, battles over the top of the city, like, you know, people jumping from roof to roof. Uh, launching metal fragments at each other, you know, pulling themselves out of the way at the last moment, mind control, um, you know, all that kind of stuff, all the while, um, you know, trying to carefully manage a very finite supply of magic within their system. It's just, it would be an absolute fun thing to see. It's It's got um, humor, it's got action, adventure, political maneuverings, introspective characters, um, just epic fight scenes, and just, you know, it would just be an absolute treat to see. So yeah, um, Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson as part of the larger Cosmere set. I personally think the Cosmere itself might be a bit too big to pull off, but if you're going to do one part of it, make sure it's Mistborn. So that's just my opinion as to what fantasy novels would be cool to see as a TV show or a movie. Leave a comment below as to what you think would be a good series. And, of course, I'm also always looking for recommendations. Um, I think you've got a pretty good uh, sense of the genre that I'd be interested in seeing and the kind of types of stuff I'd be interested in. So, um, yeah, if you can leave any suggestions, that would be greatly appreciated. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Please hit the like and subscribe button. Share this with your friends. Share it with your enemies, too. I really don't care. And more videos will be coming out whenever I get around to it. Have a good day. Or don't have a good day. You're adults. You can have any kind of day you want. See you later.